I would like to hand over to Saad, who is, uh, yeah, a long-term member of the Global Innovation Gathering, uh, who is, uh, yeah, a geek of all trades, I would say, or he would also say, um, from uh, coffee to fermentation to anything you can eat. Um, there is a lab he co-founded, uh, the, uh, the Edible Makerspace. I hope it's also editable. <laughs> <laughs> it is. That's wonderful. Um, there is a wonderful community and NGO um, he's uh, supporting since many years, Engineering Good in Singapore, um, that works uh, with children with uh, uh, disabilities. Um, there is the Salvage Garden Makerspace uh, that he co-founded out of the um, Engineering Good uh, work. And um, yeah, there's just too many, uh, too much to say about you, Saad. I think you will uh, add to this uh, in the presentation and share a lot more on um, the amazing projects you're working on. So I'm very excited for this and hand over to you. Thanks, Sandra. That's an excellent introduction. I was actually quite um, taken with the stories that you were sharing about uh, who's in this program and I feel like I'm missing out I've got hashtag FOMO right now um, want to be a participant as well as contribute as much as I can um, but very glad to be uh, among you all some very nice faces um, I have uh, projects that I'd like to share and I'm very inspired looking at other people's projects I kind of get an idea about what you care about and what you're interested in uh, so for me as a geek uh, things uh, really sort of uh, consolidate what um, the mind is. Um, so I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures um, so you don't have to stare at my, my face all the time. Um, and I think we're good to go. So this is a little bit about me. Um, like Sandra said, <laughs> I'm obsessed with uh, all things tech, but that I blame it on the coffee. Um, I describe myself as a coffee snob, um, but that is usually because um, it's an occupational hazard. Uh, tech uh, requires long hours and coffee sort of keeps the brain cells going. And I'm hoping that I'm making sense to other people because I've had quite a bit today. Um, but my line of work is in tech. Um, and I've been volunteering my time uh, with a nonprofit organization and other things uh, that try and apply this tech towards um, uh, meaningful uh, purposes. And uh, one of those, uh, an outcome of that is something called uh, Salvage Garden, which is a makerspace that um, allows for playing with tech for good. And so, um, without getting too uh, bogged down in details, that's kind of a, a, a the way I see myself. It's the, the sort of three areas, there's the day job, there's the volunteer work, and then there's the maker side of me that sort of ties them all together. Um, so what I'd like to share with you today is a couple of examples uh, that I'm hoping um, will uh, inform the work that uh, we're all doing in this group. Um, the nature of things uh, is is always uh, when when we present things, it seems like it's just one person doing everything, um, but it's uh, not the case. And I'm sure everybody in the group is intimately familiar with that. But just to put a sense, to give you a feel of what this is like, uh, volunteering for me was a way to step away from the screen. Uh, this is before COVID, um, but... Uh, Engineering Good as a nonprofit charity allowed for interfacing with people that I wouldn't otherwise interact with in my tech space. Uh, and that is super interesting and valuable to me. Um, making those personal connections is what allowed for this work to be meaningful. So that's what it kind of looked like. In the last two years, um, there have been some um awful circumstances that everybody has had to adapt to. Um, I was able to work with uh, some of these volunteers to respond to the COVID situation. And in Singapore, um, 
that looked very different than other parts of the world, uh, the need that was felt and that was expressed was a lack of devices, lack of appropriate devices for uh, children to do home-based learning. And uh, initially, uh, a number of volunteers came forward and said, look, we can uh, come together, find ways to uh, uh, take laptops that are donated by other people that have an extra laptop or an older device that's, that's sitting at home, clean it up, and then send it to people who can't afford their own laptop. Um, and so we were in, um, we, we, we got a lot of attention uh, in the media for uh, being able to respond to the need of the time uh, with a whole bunch of laptops. So initially this was in 2020, we got uh, a whole bunch of um, devices that people sent in and we were able to rehome these devices just by cleaning it up. I mean, you know, sanitizing it on the outside to get rid of the COVID in case there was any, but also reformatting and reinstalling uh, and doing all the geeky things that geeks like to do. Uh, and then putting it into a nice bag and sending it to families so that they can um, work from home and learn from home. So that rapidly escalated um, into 5,000 uh, devices within the span of a year. Uh, a lot of people came forward, and this is what I really like about these kinds of campaigns where people don't just sit at home um, and, uh, you know, stick with what they know, but are using the opportunity provided by a nonprofit or a charity to answer a call to a cause. And um, that's kind of what happened here. So the demand for devices went up, but so did the donors people came forward and said look i have two devices i've got three devices i have i work for a company where there are four or five devices can i send them to you and you can rehome them and so that escalated and snowballed very uh, rapidly and we were able to find enough volunteers to keep that work moving forward um and so the campaign which was computers against covid uh, has been running since then and now it's become part of the organization so we're now actually close to 10,000 devices that we've been able to repurpose and send uh, to families who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford one and that kind of looks like this in Singapore <clears throat> it's very urban dense um, and these this is kind of what it would uh, look like when for home-based learning and uh, behind the scenes which is where um, I find my inspiration, you have a bunch of volunteers and people who would otherwise be uh, working in financial institutions or banks uh, came forward and uh, not being tech geeks or nerds or anything like that, basically said, what can I do to help? And all of their organizing skills or their spreadsheeting skills and everything came into play almost immediately. People came forward and said, this is what I'm good at. I understand what's going on here. So I will take on this part and I'll start doing it. Uh, and that's how we were able to make all of those devices uh, salvaged uh, to, to be able to repurpose them and send them off to uh, different homes. As you can see, there's there's a lot of um, devices that came with um, all sorts of problems with it. Uh, our job was to try and figure out how best to clean them up and send them out. We sometimes had to work with furry creatures as well. This was our uh, stray cat who happened to be near, near the office. And uh, since it was in lockdown situations, nobody was looking after the strays and the people that normally feed the cat had disappeared. So she wandered into our little volunteer operation and we taught her how to fix laptops. I'm kidding, but you know, she was there, which is great. Um, the operation was uh, set up in a little stadium. Uh, which was again shut down because nobody was allowed to go and interact with uh, other human beings. And we were able to use that space uh, to take these devices apart and repurpose them. Um, and a lot of the devices that came to us uh, were uh, not working, as in they were either too old um, or um, they had something wrong with them. And our job as volunteers was to try and figure out what the problem was and then. Um, take them apart, see if they can be fixed, put them together as best we can and then send them out. Oftentimes that meant um, 
taking parts from one system and then uh, putting it into another uh, so that out of the two that don't work, at least one can be sent out. Uh, and that's where the name Salvage Garden came about. Because in Singapore, everything is small. We have tiny little places. We don't exactly have gardens. Uh, for uh, We've got high-rise apartments where everybody lives. And so uh, we, didn't, we don't really have salvage yards where you can go and rummage through other people's things. Um, so gardens are the best we can do. And so salvage garden seemed appropriate, uh, but you can see the the, na the nature of uh, the problem that we were dealing with was basically uh, piles and piles of laptops, uh, which would otherwise uh, either be collecting dust in somebody's cabinet or uh, be sent to e-waste for uh, processing. Um, so we were able to make the most of what we had um, using the concept of makerspace and uh, bringing volunteers in and saying, look, so you have some interest in technology, you have some experience with how to you know, work with laptops, uh, why don't you try and apply those skills uh, to try to repurpose these devices for a good cause? And a lot of the skills that we came with, a lot of the volunteers um, weren't up to task in the sense that it's not like we were trained for this. So it was just a whole bunch of uh, YouTube videos, watching YouTube videos, trying to do troubleshooting by opening things up and poking it with a stick and figuring out whether or not it um, would cause sparks or plugging it into something else and seeing if it turned on. Uh, and looking up the model number on YouTube and seeing if there was like somebody else who had a similar problem. It's things that we've now gotten used to doing uh, since everybody is on things like Zoom and video conferencing. We're all tech experts, or at least we're good at tech support, uh, which is something we probably couldn't claim to have been good at uh, two years ago. Um, so an unintended consequence of uh, being forced to do online things uh, has this unexpected positive benefit of equalizing everyone. Um, so we're all good or relatively better now at trying to troubleshoot tech issues. Um, and so that's exactly the skill that um, the people who volunteered uh, were able to bring to the table. And we were applying it towards, you know, trying to get laptops to families. And of course, it helps to have a cat in the makerspace. Uh, she was actually the source of joy and happiness that kept everything moving. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's the sort of a brief history of um, where I'm coming from and how my current uh, obsession and, and uh, work, nature of my work is, has been informed. Uh, it's all around uh, the idea of tech for good. And very recently, we have the distinct honor of being recognized uh, as um, um, uh, honorable mention for being a digital community by the pre Ars Electronica. And uh, this is something that um, helps motivate volunteers to continue doing this kind of work. So that's what we're trying to channel towards um, uh, trying to make the most out of uh, the resources that are available around us. And um, sort of thinking back to the um, stories and, and the projects that were shared earlier, um, uh, as part of this mentoring program, I think the projects that you're that each of the participants is working on uh, embodies this uh, the same kind of idea is that you look around you, understand the resources that you have access to, and try to apply them towards um, solving the problem that you've identified. Um, and so that's kind of I mean it looks very different for Singapore because you know we've got devices coming out of our ears, uh, but. Um, uh, the the needs are, are are real. The problems and the challenges are real. On paper, or if you look at from the policy standpoint, um, governments will tell you that yes, everybody at home has a device, and every everybody in Singapore is connected. It's a it's not a it, it it's it's one of those like first world problem type situations um, where the numbers suggest that everybody should be connected and should be able to do home based learning without an issue, and yet. Uh, a small little charity run by volunteers um, has processed 10,000 devices for families. So, you know, it is it is an interesting way of looking at or at least surfacing problems that would otherwise uh, not be addressed. Um, so I really like this idea of doing what you can where you are with what you have. Um, 
So it, as a consequence of this work uh, with the laptops and everything, um, we were able to expand and look at uh, the innards of these devices. Um, the more we worked on trying to solve these problems, the more we realized, look, it's probably just the hard drive. So the thing that you're seeing on your left-hand side is a whole bunch of hard drives. Um, the thing in the middle is a bunch of batteries. And on the right is miscellaneous. Uh, and these are the sorts of things that um, you're not exactly trained for, but you sort of figure out what you need to do in order to get organized in order to solve the problem. Uh, and our system changed almost every day. Um, we had no idea what kind of devices would come to us. And we had no idea what kind of volunteers would be working on them. And we had no idea how to fix them. So everything was very um, trying to figure things out as we go along. But um, one of the consequences was that um, the laptop would be fine um, if you swapped out the hard drive or you swapped out the battery or you swapped out just the charger. Um, and, you know, that was an easy fix. And we call that a win and we move, move on. But the ones that uh, you swap them out from, those are left um, unusable. And so those uh, went, made their way to uh, the e-waste processing because um, there's a lot of parts inside of a laptop and um, it's more than we would expect to us it's just a device that lets us you know uh, uh, grow zoom fatigue and get very annoyed with um, can you see my screen or oh my god you're on mute um, but on the inside it's made up of a whole bunch of different things and each of these things has some utility attached to it and the sort of um, mindset that we've been applying to trying to make things work is the exact same skill set or the same same uh, the exact same mindset uh, that can repurpose some of these things quite easily into useful objects. So I've listed out a few of the ones that we found while we were working on these broken laptops. So we found that batteries, speakers, webcams, and screens, those are the ones that can be repurposed. Um, there are a whole bunch of other like sort of art inspired ideas uh, where you could take the alphabets from the keyboard and then turn them into like alphabet spaghetti or make name badges out of them or bracelets out of them, um, which was a lot of fun because, you know, we were coming up with these ideas as we were working with these broken devices. Um, and again, the idea was, you know, it, it, it's it, there's a whole bunch of these lying around. So what can we do with them? Um, so I thought I would share a few of these examples and uh, hopefully that will spark some ideas. Because um, uh, that's exactly how we came up with these. We were looking at YouTube videos of people hacking things, taking things apart, and, and then trying to put them back together again uh, using other bits and pieces that were normally not normally meant to go in that, in that order, uh, which is exactly what hacking is. Um, so if we look at speakers for as, an, as a quick example, um, Everybody likes Bluetooth speakers, and they're pretty straightforward to understand. And if you take them apart, you've got a whole bunch of uh, pieces in it, but not as many as uh, something complicated like a laptop. So it could be or it should be uh, quite easy to make your own speaker. Um, and it turns out that the thing that powers the speaker on the inside is a tiny little uh, circuit board with a whole bunch of things on it. And it doesn't really matter what it is and and um, what you know, each of those things are, but we understand that this is what makes the music happen. And so we found uh, an online source that sells these device, these um, as a separate thing, not already packaged inside a speaker. And so we thought we we would uh, get a bunch of these things and try them out. Um, so yeah, it can be look quite scary and complicated on the surface of it, but when you take the, pull the speaker out of the laptop and put it together with a little bit of soldering, um, what you wind up with is something that looks pretty um, easy to understand just by looking at it. You've got a, a couple of speakers on the left-hand side. It's been soldered to a, a earphone jack, the same kind that we um, have on, on the earphones that we use to plug into phones. Um, and as a bonus, it comes it comes with its own remote control. And all of this costs less than $5, uh, 
which is the surprising thing to us as well, because uh, the speakers cost nothing. Uh, we rescued them from what would have been uh, e-waste. Um, and the thing in the middle is what we found to cost less than five dollars. And it um, also does uh, Bluetooth, which is excellent because then you can pair it with your phone and you can send whatever your phone can play to these speakers um, that you've salvaged from the laptop. So this was an accidental discovery, um, which uh, we turned into a fun little project uh, so that other volunteers could um, figure out their way around um, how to work with electronics. Um, the fun part with this was, how do we make a casing for this? Because, you know, by itself, uh, it looks very cool and geeky, but it looks nothing like uh, an actual speaker that you can use at home. Um, so you can get all fancy and you use 3D printers and 3D printing uh, to, you know, make the right measurements and then figure out how big your speakers are and make a really nice looking enclosure and then stick the speakers inside. Or you could just work with what you have. Uh, and this was, again, an idea that one of our uh, volunteers were, uh, had, and she was like, you know, I don't fully understand this 3D printing thing. I mean, it's cool and all that, but do we really need to have this plastic? I have this box. Can I just put it inside the box? Um, and we were like, yes, absolutely. That would be cool. Uh, in fact, it would be better than 3D printing. Um, so that's exactly what uh, she did. It was a it was a box that was used that was given to her as a birthday gift, and it used to have little scented candles inside. Uh, and then now it turned into a little Bluetooth speaker with um, uh, uh, laptop speakers that were salvaged. Um, so it's not so much the thing, um, but the idea and the thinking that goes in behind. Um, making something like this or coming up with something like this. It's not part of an arts and crafts exercise or, or a class or a course or anything like that. It's just uh, people bringing their time and efforts and energies and making the best of what they have. Um, this was something we found uh, as an inspiration for other people to follow. Uh, yeah, you can also use wood um, to make your own little box. So what you wind up with <clears throat> is a product that uh, wouldn't come out of a factory. And I think um, we could certainly use a lot more of those in our lives. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was with batteries. And this is a like a very um, uh, a touchy subject because um, of the toxic elements that goes into making these uh, cells. Um, and it, there's a lot of conversation now about EVs, uh, electric vehicles, and um, the usage of these batteries and cells is going to go up. Um, there's nothing that we can do digitally without having a power source. And with these laptops, um, it, it, it is quite tricky to deal with um, cells. But what we found um, in our experience was that we could teach kids, children, uh, around 12 to 13 years old, uh, the, the necessary safety requirements to deal with these things without hurting themselves or others around them. So with the right tools and the right safety measures and the right um, amount of education, that's all you really need. I mean, it was this was like a sort of like a 20 minute to half an hour briefing. And the kids were like, yeah, I can totally do this. And they were able to take apart uh, a whole bunch of la uh, batteries um, and the batteries, the older laptops they had were quite big and chunky, uh, and they were easier to deal with than the newer batteries that are sealed in and you can't even see them. Uh, but if you take apart a laptop battery, it looks like the picture at the bottom, the red uh, that you're seeing in the middle of the screen. It's a whole bunch of little cells, uh, and they combine them together to power something power hungry like a laptop. So we were able to take out these cells and uh, turn them into little power banks. Uh, that were super useful because you could plug your phone in and charge it. Uh, and that's what you're seeing on the left-hand side. And, you know, it gives you an opportunity to customize it and make it your own. And all you need is like a marker, a magic marker, or a Sharpie or whatever you call it. And you can draw on the power bank and it's now become your own custom-made thing. And you think twice about throwing it away. So that was the idea behind trying to make the most of uh, a whole bunch of these uh, power banks, uh, a whole bunch of these batteries that would uh, uh, otherwise wind up 
<clears throat> being processed as e-waste. Um, and on the right hand side, uh, it was a little bit more advanced thing. If you want to get like creative with soldering and hacking, you could uh, take apart the webcam, uh, which is, you know, stuck on the top of your screen, usually with a little green light next to it. Um, that's been connecting people around the world during the pandemic. Uh, in the laptop, you can take that apart. And uh, with the kind of soldering that you're seeing on the right hand side, uh, you can actually turn that into a USB webcam. Um, so those are the sorts of things that we were, I mean, those are the more practical ones um, that we were playing around with. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, if you look at the materials that come out of these um, otherwise e-waste devices in a, a way that is kind of out of the box thinking, uh, they can be put to good use. So you don't have to go online and look for brand new modules for Arduinos um, and brand new microcontrollers uh, just to make a, an idea come alive. Um, these are just a, this is just one other thing I wanted to mention quickly before uh, I move on to something else. Uh, this is a hard drive uh, that came out of a desktop computer rather than a laptop. Um, so the black thing with the red that you're seeing inside the plastic box, that is a deconstructed hard drive. And um, the red thing that you're seeing is a 3D printed um, round spinny thing uh, that holds a couple of test tubes or sample tubes inside. And those are the same sample tubes that you use uh, for COVID testing in the lab. Uh, and what happens is when you, plug, when you plug this all in and turn it on, the red thing spins around very rapidly. And that's a centrifuge. Um, and so this is an online, um, it was inspired by an online article that uh, was described by a lab uh, that was able to turn a hard drive into a centrifuge um, for something called lab in a backpack. And um, it was a scientific study that was in trying to reduce the total cost of doing a COVID test. Um, and um, this was one small little part of that larger project, but I absolutely loved it. And so did a, a number of other volunteers that I was uh, with. And we were able to recreate that scientific paper uh, by taking what was described and then recreating it just in the makerspace that we had. Um, so a little bit of 3D printing and a little bit of um, microcontroller reprogramming, following instructions. Uh, we put together a centrifuge. Um, that now uh, has potential um, cost benefits to a lab that cannot afford a centrifuge. It's not super precise. It's probably not uh, accurate enough for um, commercial purposes, but uh, in situations where you are doing citizen science or you are trying to um, um, find your own solutions while waiting for an industrial answer or industrial more permanent solution uh, it's amazingly effective um, the other thing i wanted to really quickly mention here is uh, the controller that um, the arduino the little microcontroller uh, uses is normally used on a drone um, so the thing that controls the speed of the spinny thing is the same thing that controls the speed of a uh, uh, drone's rotors. Um, so it's a weird coming together of various um, high-tech things in a very low-tech kind of way. Um, and it was all put together using um, uh, bits and pieces that uh, are not exactly hard to find. Um, but the the interest of the person behind it uh, to see it through and uh, was, was what was remarkable here. Uh, the person didn't know how to solder. And so this became a, like, how do I solder kind of uh, project. So um, it, it was a lot of fun to work with. So if anybody's interested in looking at this further, it's called Sentry Drive. Um, and it's part of Lab in a Backpack. All right, um, very quickly moving on. Uh, there are a number of other examples I want to show you, and I don't want to drag on too much. Um, but they all follow the same kind of idea um, where uh, we apply appropriate technology. And appropriate in this case is subject to the re not just um, what you are trying to solve, but also what you have access to 
if uh, you try and solve a, a problem as effectively as possible and use a high-tech solution when things go wrong or um, if it needs to be improved or changed in some way, uh, the necessary skills are not available, then it might not be appropriate. Um, following the process of design thinking, this is something that is almost ubiquitous now, but I think we need definitely no, need more of it where you involve uh, the user uh, as part of the thinking. And uh, using processes, not just materials, that are sustainable. So you are thinking about all of these things while uh, making stuff. And that to me is uh, a very effective way of applying tech uh, for good. Um, and that's actually what I really want to talk to you about um, is uh, persons with disabilities. Um, that very rapidly or very uh, effectively um, condenses uh, the, all of these requirements down into a very purposeful uh, direction. And when you look at uh, technology like um, you know, the speech to text that you see that automatically uh, captions what I'm saying, or what you see on uh, uh, YouTube videos, auto captions, all of that is good technology. But uh, for somebody who cannot hear, it's not just nice to have, it's almost essential. Um, and the marketplace where these kinds of assistive tech are sold and, and, and um, made available, uh, they reflect um, the percentage of people who uh, represent that market. And it's a small percentage of everybody else. And so the cost of these things tends to be very high. Um, so it looks like any other marketplace, uh, but what you're seeing on the screen is a bunch of buttons. And each of these buttons seems to cost an awful lot. Like the one in the middle is $65, um, or the big red one on the bottom right, that's also $65. And it doesn't make any sense because it doesn't exactly have, um, I don't know, uh, it, 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 it's just a button. It doesn't do anything else. You press it and whatever is connected to either turns or turns on or turns off or gets triggered in some way. Um, it's just a button and it shouldn't cost $65. And especially if you are somebody who has special needs, uh, why are you spending $65 on a button? But that is the marketplace. And sometimes these big buttons are used for something very fun and enduring, like plugging it into a toy. Um, and these toys normally have uh, little switches at the back that, you know, with tiny little fingers um, that may not have fine motor control. Uh, it's hard to operate. And so plugging in a button is great. But what's weird about this uh, is that the button costs $65 and the toy costs less than $10. So it very rarely is used in this case. Um, um, so you wind up using the buttons for very practical and pragmatic things like turning on and off lights or uh, opening and closing doors. And very rarely do they get applied uh, to things like toys. Um, so enter the um, low-cost alternative, 3D printing and repurposing. Um, and I think that there's a lot of potential here um, for reducing the barriers to, um, I mean, the, at least the affordability barriers to um, these kinds of devices, but it also allows for customization and personalization. So not only are you reducing the cost to the consumer, but you're also opening up the possibility where uh, that shape of that thing doesn't have to be fixed like it came out of a factory. You can uh, shape it according to the needs of the individual. And of course, you know, because it's low cost, you can plug it into something like a toy. And if it breaks, it's fine. You can just print another one. Um, so this is kind of the work that we've been doing. And we found this is like super popular and a lot of fun because the thing that you're doing at the end of the day is you're helping children with disabilities play with the toys that they otherwise feel like they're being left out with, um, uh, without having control over the thing. They just sit back and watch these things run around on the on the floor. Uh, but with some level of control, uh, it's not just fun. It gives them a sense of agency, which they otherwise uh, would apply to something very practical and utilitarian. So it's not just 3D printing. Um, the design that you're seeing on the screen um, is, is something that was um, uh, collaboratively put together uh, by a bunch of people 
uh, in response to uh, trying to solve the problem of 65 talk switches. Uh, but 3D printing is not the only way to do that. Uh, you can do that with other objects that you find around the house. Um, so what you're seeing is a couple of examples of that. Uh, the thing in the middle with the bell on it is uh, a switch that you normally find outside of uh, somebody's house. Um, and these things are designed to be very hardy because they're, you know, they're outdoors and they withstand rain and, and sunshine. So the switch that you uh, make out of this can withstand quite a lot of bashing. Um, and some of these kids, they don't have a fine motor control. So um, they're able to just go crazy and, and whack these things uh, as much as they like. And they'll stand up to it without falling apart. Um, and it's very low cost. It costs less than $10, which is excellent. Um, and we teach people how to make them. Um, so it, 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 it's, 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 it's a lot of fun to learn about making your own devices. Uh, so the blue one next to that is a clothes peg. It's normally used um, in Singapore. This is very common. Uh, clothes hang outside to dry. And they usually hang on a pole. Um, and so to prevent the clothes from flying off, you have a blue uh, a peg that holds them in place. And what we've done here is taken that uh, idea and put a switch inside of it. Uh, so when you squeeze the peg, it will trigger the toy. Um, and then the last one on the right hand side is a is an emergency light or a light that you normally use uh, for cupboards and things. We've took, taken out the light. Um, and uh, turned it into a switch. So you just whack it and it turns on whatever it's attached to. Um, so to describe how these things are used, I, uh, I'd like to play you a little video of somebody using some of these devices. Um, so it's not just toys uh, with assistive devices. So the black keyboard you're seeing is something that was commercially purchased and it costs hundreds of dollars, but that was not quite good enough for this user. And um, the mouse <clears throat> that is commercially available was too sensitive. Um, so we built something out of a trackball that is normally used in arcade games. And she's using this in combination with uh, a doorbell switch. And the thing I really like about this is that she's just using it to skip uh, ads on YouTube videos, which is exactly what you know we want this kind of technology to be used. So. Um, the idea is and similar to what we were doing with the laptops, um, but we're taking apart commercially made mass produced objects like uh, emergency lights and so on, and then teaching caregivers how to modify them. Um, and that's the sort of critical part of this, uh, where we're not just making a product and selling it, uh, we're involving the caregivers in a process that uh, gives them control over um, what uh, devices, what these devices are look like and how they operate. Because um, the person who is using these devices knows best and the person who use, knows second best is usually the person who is offering the care, uh, doing the caregiving. And the caregivers are often overlooked. Um, the market for assistive devices doesn't exactly uh, work in the same way for uh, this kind of a situation. Um, so we try and, and bring making uh, um, behavioral therapists or co uh, cognitive behavioral therapists or just parents or uh, the users themselves. And it can be a lot of fun uh, if you just plug them into a toy. Um, so that way you learn how to use these devices and these tools uh, are no longer alien to you. Uh, you understand them and you don't think of them as, no, 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 I'm not techie or geeky enough. Um, I'll leave it to somebody else to do it because you're solving a purpose, uh, you're solving a, a very meaningful um, uh, problem with it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to play with these things. Um, and all sorts of toys can be made. So that's assistive switches. Um, and of course, yes, these are, <laughs> this is what uh, you, you get when you get, when you have toys that are popular with um, cognitive behavioral therapists. You have uh, two people trying to be dinosaurs and two people trying to be a pepper pig. So with assistive devices, um, it uh, applies, I think, critical making in a very effective way. And it doesn't have to be high tech. Uh, it can be as simple as uh, a bunch of um, 
toys connected to switches. But the idea is um, the key takeaway here, I think, is inclusive design. We are able to involve the caregivers uh, in the design process uh, to be able to come up with something that is uh, meaningful and effective. Um, I mean, even if it's just to reduce the cost, but also to um, uh, if, if something breaks, they don't have to come to you. They're able to try and fix it themselves. Um, but the, the idea is that they are able to bring ideas and say, look, this thing that I just learned how to make is um, fine, but I can make it better. And that feeds back into the system um, in, in a very effective way. Um, all right, so I want to show you now a slightly more uh, complicated or complex uh, example, um, which is something that is um, being talked about recently with a lot of rumor and speculation uh, around Apple's announcement or uh, speculation about Apple coming up with an augmented reality device. Um, but the one that has been around since I think 2015 uh, is Google Glass. And uh, recently there was an article, there's a link uh, that I've uh, included in the slide there um, for uh, looking at applying these devices that failed in the, in the mass market, but in special cases, I think uh, would be super useful. Uh, so it's, a, I think, a good example of tech for good, but the label at the bottom right corner where it says nine. $199 is the price of one of these devices. So the cost remains prohibitive. And the reason it becomes quite apparent when you try and take apart and look at what's inside the Google Glass. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that uh, a lot of very smart, capable engineers got paid for uh, to design and build so that a device like this would be as uh, neat and sleek and, and um, as not as obvious and in your face as, um, as as small as they could make it. And in spite of that, it didn't exactly have the right reception. Um, most people found it invasive and um, getting in the way of their privacy uh, because it had a camera looking out. Um, and that wasn't, it, it kind of defeated the purpose. Um, but the need for uh, persons with disabilities was still present. Um, if this had made it to a uh, mass market, then it would probably have been affordable, uh, but for whatever reason, it didn't. <clears throat> um, so the uh, request that came to us was uh, specifically around Google Glass, uh, where somebody with hearing impairment said that, look, this is quite cool, um, but I can't afford it. Can you do something with this? And so we took a look at the core of what that Google Glass was, uh, and the need was um, some kind of a screen that would display text. Again, similar to uh, the auto captions that you see underneath YouTube, or in some cases like this video, uh, it'll like caption what I'm saying. Um, the um, uh, at at the end of the. Uh, day, the, re the request was, can you make a screen that can be wearable? And so we took a look at this and took it apart and re-engineered it using um, as low cost uh, options as we could find. Um, and we came up with a prototype that cost one tenth of the Google Glass just by getting rid of the most expensive things, which was um, you know the optics, the lenses, and uh, high resolution, high density, tiny little screen that needs to be magnified and projected into somebody's eye. So instead of that, all we did was you know to take the screen and put it far away, far enough away that um, you can still read what's on the screen um, and adjustable. So you don't have to get like prescription lenses. All you have to do is move the screen further or closer according to um, how your eyesight is. Um, but you know, it wasn't exactly like a jump. Uh, we didn't go straight to it. There was a prototyping process involved. And this is uh, our favorite uh, way of doing things, which is like to stick a bunch of things together and see what happens. Um, this is a chopstick prototype. We have a lot of chopsticks lying around. Everybody has a drawer full of chopsticks. Um, they come with takeaway noodles. Um, so we put stuck a bunch of things together, uh, stuck the screen on it and try and figure it out, look, if, if we do it like this, will it work? And it turns out 
that um, it's possible uh, with tiny little screens that are, don't cost much and a Raspberry Pi, uh, which was a lot of uh, fun to work with. Uh, microcontrollers are, I think, just a, a joy to play with. Um, and we came up with a whole bunch of different variants of it um, and uh, had, uh, uh, so this, at the end of the prototyping process, uh, wound up being made out of uh, carbon fiber. No, it was fiberglass and uh, the rods that you're seeing are not chopsticks, uh, but are taken from kites. So when you have large kites, uh, they use these things to um, hold uh, the structure together. So it's very lightweight and very easy to cut. You can just use a pair of scissors um, and all the other bits that you're seeing are 3D printed uh, and you, they can be adjusted. Uh, so at the, at the end of this uh, stick like thing, you're seeing a microphone and all the wires in the middle are leading up to a Raspberry Pi. Uh, which connects to Wi-Fi and connects to um, the cloud service, which picks up the thing that is being said and then translates it or at least interprets it in, uh, displays it on the screen as text. So it's speech to text in a wearable format and it costs one-tenth of uh, what Google Glass was. Again, it doesn't look as neat and and, and sleek as what a factory made one would. But what it allowed for is to give it to people and say, look, this is what it, 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 it looks like. And this is what it, it feels like. Um, how do you feel about this? And then the minute we tried it with uh, hearing aid users, um, we found out that you know what we had planned to do was not exactly up to uh, the user needs. And if you see on the right-hand side, um, uh, one of our, test volunteer testers here who's using a hearing aid, um, the 3D printed thing gets in the way. There's too much on the ear that's already, um, uh, it's not comfortable. And so uh, we got feedback uh, from the users and we were able to change the design uh, and we got rid of the 3D printed ear hooks. And based on their suggestion, we had a little um, strap uh, that replaced that. And the sort of consequence of that is that you don't even need uh, to have that little triangular thing that rests on the nose. Um, so this is the process that really helps. Once you have a, a working prototype, you're able to give it to somebody and then say, look, this is what the, we're trying to make. Um, what do you think? And then that changes the design and changes the, the way we think about things. Um, and so it winds up being something else. Um, just doing a quick check on time. All right. Um, so I wanted to show you uh, an, an example of what happens when you open source things. Um, and uh, we've been talking a lot about STEM, which is science, technology, uh, engineering, mathematics. But the A part in STEM, which makes it STEAM, is all about the arts. And that's something that I'm very excited about. Uh, and this is something that uh, I'm hoping to use as a challenge to take my STEM experience and kick it up a notch. Um, so I've been working with a group called Access Arts Hub, which is uh, a consortium of people and organizations in Singapore that have been trying to make uh, arts more accessible. So we're talking about like stage performances and theaters, um, not just movie theaters, but also performance stages, performance theaters, where you have um, uh, plays that have limited seating or limited um, options for persons with disabilities. And um, so there's a group that's trying to change that in Singapore. And I've been working with them to, um, uh, with, with uh, ways to make things affordable. Uh, but before I jump into that, a quick segue into um, healthcare. Uh, and what you're seeing here is an example of a community response to COVID. Um, while the um, uh, healthcare workers were trying to battle uh, with the rising cases, the factory production was not able to keep up with personal protective equipment. Um, and we had a whole bunch of makers who came up and, and uh, tried to find stopgap solutions. Um, and people with 3D printing these face shields that you're seeing on the screen, 
so all of these orange bits came out of 3D printers from probably not far away from where this um, this this dentist office is. Um, so they were made locally by uh, somebody who ha who knew how to uh, 3D print things instead of coming from far away factories and mass production. Uh, and they you know served the purpose. They were able to protect people until normal large scale production resumed. And I'm hoping that you know this doesn't go away and we're able to leverage some of this know how and make it work for other purposes. Um, so the reason why I find this um, inspiring and relevant is because of the sort of way, the way the, this particular design evolved was entirely through community participation. Um, people said, look, we need to make this. This is a good idea. I have a 3D printer. And then very rapidly online through forums and discussions and comments, um, as you probably have experienced, people leave you feedback and say, look, it doesn't print on my printer, or I can only print one at a time, or, uh, it, it, you know, I, I, can we make this, like, can we find a way to make this faster? Um, and so there's this, like, very rapid uh, iteration of different ideas and designs, and the shape that we wound up with uh, is a shape that is now being used um, very commonly as something commonly found around the world and there's no one person who was behind it or no one organization behind it and it is truly open sourced and very rapidly uh went from being just an idea to uh being ubiquitous so um what i did was shamelessly borrow or shamelessly uh steal from if you like um and apply that to the use case that i described earlier um, so what you saw uh, before was a speech to text wearable where you have a tiny little screen that um, uh, displays uh, text in response to what somebody is saying. And that's a microphone. And that, and that was custom built for whoever came in. So we measure their um, size of their heads and then we adjust it so that it fits that one individual. But in the case of uh, Access Arts Hub, the request was... Um, to have something that is universal, something that people can just slip onto their heads and have the same kind of screen where you can dis where you can see text, but the text is not speech to text. It's just subtitles of um, what is being said on the stage and what the actors are saying to each other. So somebody who comes in with hearing impairments, either just a hearing aid or their own assistive device, they're able to pick this up at the box office or at the entrance, slip it on and use it if they want to um, adjust it again in a very rudimentary analog kind of way um, and then just enjoy the show. And then when they when the show is done, they leave it behind. They don't they're not stuck with something that they have to then care for. Uh, that was the intention. And it was a, like an iteration of um, exactly that. When you, 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 what we tried to do with um, I hear, which is the speech to text thing. Uh, we borrowed from the uh, face shield model and then made a 3D printable version uh, that people could just slip on and then use it to watch uh, a show. In this case, we were um, uh, doing this with a theater company that was putting on a performance that was outdoors. And if you think about it, uh, in, indoors on a stage, you can have a screen somewhere that shows you the subtitles. But if it's an outdoor performance, and in COVID, it's really good to have uh, an outdoor performance, uh, you can't really put a subtitle screen. You can't just drag it along with you outside. It, it doesn't, it's not practical. So the wearable really uh, made a lot of sense. Um, and we were able to invite uh, hearing aid users and hearing impairment people with hearing impairments uh, to come and try it out. And uh, so they, you know, watched the show uh, and they had some very interesting things to say. And of course, it kind of looks really cool. It makes you look like a cyborg. So you have to take selfies with it, uh, which is a lot of fun. Um, but I want to show you a little quick video of like behind the scenes. Um, uh, when we were testing this out, we discovered very quickly something that we didn't anticipate, um, which is uh, if you if you look at how um, it's being worn, this, the play hasn't started yet, um, and the audience is just gathering, waiting for the the uh, performers to show up. But having this wearable basically means that your hands are free. And you can either hold on to the device that you, you are using for other purposes, uh, either for assistive purposes or just, you know, communication, 
um, and you can use your hands to do sign. And it makes a lot of sense. So this is something that wasn't exactly anticipated, but it just kind of very naturally happened. Um, so very excited by the possibilities around this. All right, so um, that particular project still remains to be uh, developed. The prototype uh, and the pilot uh, got to that point. This was just a few months ago. Um, and uh, based on funding and so on, probably take it to the next level, but um, it, 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 it was very inspiring for me. Um, and there's a lot of learnings to go into it, but um, we'll, we'll see where it goes from here. Um, very uh, nicely brings me to the idea of um, what we've been talking about, critical making um, and Carables, which is a program that I've been involved with, uh, uh, with Sandra and others. Um, in the past, and um, I keep going back to Carables because um, of um, the relevance to the to the work that I'm now doing. So all the ideas that are encapsulated by this project are still highly relevant, and um, with uh, the response to COVID, um, hopefully um, we're able to channel some of these learnings towards um, daily living um, and self care and things like that. One of these examples I just wanted to really quickly point out uh, was uh, a little something very simple and ubiquitous that uh, we don't uh, normally think about. And the thing on the left is something I found on Carables. And the thing on the right is something that I made in Singapore. And it looks very similar uh, because it is exactly the same uh, thing. But if you look a little bit closer, uh, the thing that it's attached to is completely different. They're both, both made for wheelchairs, but no two wheelchairs are the same. Um, so the handle of uh, the wheelchair on the right is something that I had to redesign, um, a, a holder, but everything on top of that is exactly the same as what was designed and shared on Carables. And so something as simple as this uh, opens up a whole bunch of possibilities. It allows for people to have a conversation about what they really need. And uh, instead of going to a marketplace and looking for expensive uh, solutions, they're able to say, okay, look, 3D printing can customize it for my needs. So the product becomes suitable for me rather than me trying to find ways to adjust to a product that's available at the marketplace. And that opened up a conversation uh, for me with another group of people called Smart PFA. And they are um, a project that is mapping um, all of the accessible wheelchair accessible pathways around Singapore. And with Singapore, it is um, manageable, I would say, because it's not that big. It's an island city country. Um, so with volunteer effort, they're able to do this. Uh, but while volunteering with them, uh, one of the things that the volunteers said was, how do you open doors when you have to wheel yourself around? When you've got both your hands on the wheelchair, when you try and open a door, um, your wheelchair gets pushed back. So how do you do that? Um, so in order to try and address that, there was a lot of um, sharing from actual wheelchair users and there's, that builds empathy. Uh, and one of the things that came out in that conversation was, um, while you're trying to open doors, you can't be holding on to anything, uh, let alone a hot drink or a cold drink or even your phone. So you need both your hands. So you need places to put things. And that's kind of what led to um, this. And now there's a host of um, uh, potential solutions that are coming in place in response to working with Smart PFA. The one that I wanted to highlight is a request for um sort of a rain shelter and in singapore it rains a lot we are like a degree off the equator so um it's it's the weather is not exactly the same as other parts of the world uh but it's either hot humid or rainy and hot and humid um but the rainy part really does throw off a lot of electronic <laughs> electrical wheelchairs or just other normal wheelchairs and so this is the design uh, that we found on carables to be quite informative um so somebody's already worked on this and we are now looking at this as a way to try and find a solution that works for Singapore weather and Singapore wheelchairs. Um, so we're working on things like this. 
And uh, once we have a solution um, or something that works for us, the intention is to share it back um, on Carable. So often that tends to be overlooked. I mean, you download something, you 3D print it, um, and you know it either works for you or it doesn't, and then you, you move on to other things. Uh, but when you have access to a makerspace and you have access to people who are motivated by designing things or redesigning things, um, closing that loop of putting things back online uh, so that other people will be able to download it and try and improve on it. That's super essential. And, and now that we're all experts in <laughs> solving tech problems, I'm hoping that we'll be less shy about doing uh, that kind of work. Um, so these are the sorts of people I'm trying to reach out to. These were the wonderful faces of Singaporeans who responded to the PPE shortage and used their 3D printing skills to make something as simple as uh, um, ear savers, you know, the ones that keep the mask off the back of the ears. Um, but what I love about this is the community spirit that just sort of came out uh, in response to addressing a social need. So that brings us back to what we've been talking about. Um, and I'm very, very excited and very uh, enthused by the people who are in uh, this uh, series. And I'm, um, uh, uh, making things that make sense is something that I uh, felt comfortable talking about, but I'm very keen to learn more about the others. And there are amazing people who are uh, part of the series that, you know, uh, are very honored to be um, among. Um, I just wanted to leave you with a couple of resources that uh, keep coming up for me. I mean, there's hundreds of, of uh, things that that you would you would find when you start looking into this. But the ones that I wanted to highlight, the ones that I keep going back to, uh, all happen to end with able. So there's carryables, there's instructables, and there's printables, um, which I thought was a very interesting pattern. Um, but all of them are very excellent resources. And I find myself going back to them uh, quite often. Um, so I think this, we're going to see more of this. Uh, we're probably going to add um, Wikifactory and Apropedia to the list, um, depending on how the participants in this program um, change the dynamic of the content that's on it. Um, so yes, we're based, I'm based in Singapore. Um, Salvage Garden is the little makerspace and we're entirely driven by volunteers. Uh, so if you know somebody who can help us or if you want to join us, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, and with that, I'm going to leave you my contact and then hand it back to Sandra. I'm so happy we have you here as um, the kickoff talk um, for the critical making mentoring. Because yeah, you you encompassed all the different topics uh, we will be working on, uh, and that will be um, important for the participants, and uh, I think also for the wider world. Um, so we will take a huge effort to make everybody watch this, <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, you shared about share how you make uh, about include um, communities about all the different things that inform your practical work um, that changes lives uh, every day so that's amazing and uh, I thank you so much and um, we will take some questions um, live we will have a space in the forum uh, on Ricky Factory to get more questions also uh, for everyone who um, didn't watch this live or who comes up with a question uh, in five minutes <laughs> that uh, you don't have at the moment. Um, so I'm happy to have uh, your questions here in the chat. Um, we're not uh, doing this kind of classic webinar thing where people need to vote up questions uh, and you don't see what other people question. Um, so that's, uh, I think, the, the more open, uh, the nicer. And um, yeah, we will have some uh, time in the forum to really uh, get further into the topic and um, while you are typing um, I also want to say again wonderful sad like Oscar is saying because <laughs> it's just wonderful um, we will also do some write-ups I think um, so it's um, even more accessible for everybody 
um, share the closed captioning, of course, also as an individual file and hopefully also your slides uh, so that people can really access things um, very easily. And I want to, uh, yeah, distill some learnings from your presentation that are, you must uh, admit, uh, like, if you watch the story, you can understand the questions uh, and the uh, learnings better than just with reading five points of how you should create your making, right? So <laughs> it's still uh, very helpful to, to watch the full hour. So, and I see a lot of wonderfuls um, and wonderfuls and wonderfuls. <laughs> Sarah says, I uh, loved hearing about your work in accessibility. It's food for thought. And Matthew says, I like the fixing part. And uh, Vuga says, uh, wonderful. I think you met uh, in that crew even. <laughs> ah. And there's Oscar that says, uh, Sad, do you have a plan to expand the project to other countries? And I yes. might add, uh, is there a prototype so that other people can just create it in their own countries? <laughs> That's an excellent question, Oscar. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, the plan is, I mean, I'm based in Singapore um, and I've been constantly trying to find ways to work with um, Singapore's neighbors. Cause you know, like I said, Singapore is a tiny little city country island. Um, but uh, very urban dense, There's lots of people squeezed into tiny little places. Um, and the it, 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 we're, we're quite privileged in that we've got access to technology and access to lots of different things that um, our neighbors don't otherwise um, have the same level of access. So I feel like the impact of some of these uh, low cost and accessible options would be a lot more meaningful uh, in places like Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Philippines, these are our Southeast Asian neighbors. And um, what I'm trying to do is um, channel some of the volunteer effort um, towards making inroads to uh, engaging um, people in our Southeast Asian neighborhood. Um, and in the past, I mean, in the because of the whole COVID situation, it has been quite challenging. Um, to try and do something hands-on and I personally uh, feel quite disconnected uh, when it, it, there is no hands-on like physical thing that you can hand somebody and say look this thing is what we're talking about uh, how do you feel about the thing um, even though it's digital and it's tech uh, having the thing really changes the dynamic of the conversation um, so yeah the intention is to try and find um, partners and collaborators who are able to um, 3D print them locally or there is an intention to recreate them in other countries. And so my, my the channeling the, the volunteer effort from Singapore to support that effort is something that is uh, totally doable. Um, so if there is interest in a specific project or a derivative based on the project, then I'm more than happy to find ways to do that. I hope that answers the question. Super cool. Thank you. Rafaela says uh, that he will follow your documentations. Um, so hopefully have similar projects for his people. Rafaela, do you want to uh, share some more? Okay. <laughs> ah, it was so lovely to see you. And uh, goodbye to those who are needing to leave um, because we're like... <laughs> nine minutes over time now. Um, I wanted to ask uh, one thing to Saad, uh, which is about, um, yeah, an inspiration, an idea um, that you would like to um, give the participants as a, as a task um, for the coming weeks uh, so they can explore um, some more of your concepts or of the concepts you shared. <laughs> No, that's a very good idea. What I have been um, personally, uh, what I found personally motivating is a lot of um, these kinds of um, bits and pieces that can, you know, you can borrow an idea from like the face shield and apply it to something that is like a wearable captioning device. Um, they're small little elements 
in other projects that you can borrow from. And um, when you look at assistive tech, I find that very quickly, um, if you think about one-handed operation, like instead of uh, doing something that you normally do every day, just do it with one hand, uh, it very uh, immediately makes you think differently about all of the objects that you take for granted or you don't really think uh, closely about. Um, and an example I'd like to show is this. This is a, a PlayStation controller with a whole bunch of 3D printed stuff on top. And it was designed by a Japanese gamer who had a friend who only had one hand. Um, and what this is, is again, it's just brilliant. I love it so much. Um, it's something that I printed here. It's um, not specifically for an individual, but I'm using it as a way to inspire somebody to say, look, I want to be a gamer, even though I have um, uh, limitations. Um, and if you look at the controller, the a way that you normally use this is with, is with two hands. You hold you hold it with two hands like this. And if you, um, oop, hang on, I'm gonna just take this off. And if you uh, use your thumb, you're able to control everything on this side. But then how do you control the buttons on that side if you only have one hand? So the 3D printed stuff basically allows you to press this and that translates what you're pressing to the button on this side. So you could press all these buttons and it'll press these buttons on that side which is like a very clever way of, of using, and it's just it's just plastic, it's just 3D printed. And it's even got a little uh, switch. Uh, so you, these buttons that you normally press, you can't reach like that. So it's very cleverly designed um, and it's uh, it just snaps on. So you can you can take this apart and it comes off and you still have your controller. It's, it's just beautifully designed. And there's some very clever things that um, the designer has put in here, like, um, um, instead of using screws for the joints, um, he's used a piece of filament. So you don't have to go out and buy screws and find the right size of screws. You can just put a piece of filament inside and it'll hold the two together. And this is something that you can use for, uh, you know, uh, non-heavy duty kind of uh, applications. And I was so taken with this idea that I was like, why didn't I think of this? Uh, and now I've been trying to find ways to use this for everything. Um, instead of making a hole in a 3d printed design for a screw i'm just like making it big enough for filament which everybody has anyway because you know you're pre-3d printing things you just stick it in there and it holds it together it's not great but it's good enough and if it comes off you can always just put another piece in there um and this one i mean i've been showing it to a lot of people and it still hasn't come across come apart so i'm quite impressed with it so stuff like this uh, is what I would challenge people to think about. I mean, if you think about uh, your everyday objects around you, just think about doing it with one hand and you automatically like go into this uh, um, assistive tech kind of mindset. That's, I mean, this is what works for me. I'm not sure if, if you will find it as, but yeah, I, uh, that's what's inspiring me right now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Saad. Um, that was super inspiring, super interesting. Um, and we're very happy to have you here. Um, happy to be yeah. here. For whoever wants to be in contact with you, um, you are part of our community for the critical making community in Wikifactory. And you also shared your handles, which is sad caffeine for most social networks, I think. Um, or if you want to um, find sad somewhere, uh, I don't know, LinkedIn or something, uh, I can type the name again, Sachinoy, um, so you can find him. And with this, I'm saying thank you, everyone, uh, for joining. Thank you, everyone, um, for contributing to the program. And I'm very much looking forward to the next steps together with you. We will meet again in the forum. And we Excellent. will meet again next month. Um, and there we will uh, speak about Share How You Make. And we'll get um, a video lecture from uh, Emilio from Apropedia. So stay tuned for that. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you. Have a great rest of your days. You too. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.